Okay. I will let the I will let the chat open. So if you want to ask anything, you can interrupt me, like, uh, or write in the chat as you wish. So it's a great pleasure to have a, another lecture of Raphael with us today, second lecture. I just uh, remember that. We will post the the, uh, the video on the, our conference webpage, and Raphael has all the slides and material in his webpage. And I guess we see even the link to the video if you can, he wants. Okay, so Raphael, the floor is, is yours. Please. Uh -huh. Thank you, Stefanella. Uh, all right, so second part of our uh, four lessons mini course about TDA. <laughs> Uh, just to come back to the what we said two days ago, I've been asked this nice question by, I don't remember who asked me that. I, I gave a proof of uh, this uh, non availability of the module strip in the plane. The idea was you 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 drew, you drew uh, two circles in the module strip that only intersect once. Uh, if you had an embedding, you would obtain uh, two circles in the plane that only intersect once, which is impossible. Uh, and then someone asked me, uh, what about if the two circles are actually just tangent, right? Um, so you have to prove that the image of these two circles are not two tangent circles. And so I thought about this uh, simple argument to prove that they have to intersect, not only be tangent. Uh, and the idea is that you draw a little circle around the intersection uh, uh, of these uh, uh, two uh, circles in the strip. And as you can see here, if you go around the circle, it goes uh, first circle, purple, orange, purple again, and orange again. And so you have to preserve this ordering uh, when you are in, uh, immersed in, in, the, in, the, in the plane. So you have to follow orange, purple, orange, purple. And this shows that, I mean, let's say you have the first circle orange. This shows that you have to cross the, the other circle, right? You could prove that with a Jordan theorem for closed curves. So that shows that the circles cannot be tangent uh, in, in this uh, immersion. That was the first thing. Uh, I gave you an exercise also to do. Uh, I asked you to prove that the semi-open interval 0, 1 and the open interval 0, 1 are not homomorphic. Um, does someone have any idea about how to prove that? To, to consider just the, the two sets, the single tone and the open set. Mm. You have to, you have to, yeah, it's actually the, the um, an equivalent proof that what, what I what I gave two days ago. Uh, uh, I show you the solution here. You suppose that they are homomorphic, right? So you have. Uh, uh, a bicontinuous map F from the first uh, to the second one. And what you do is you remove the points zero here. So the point zero has an image, F zero, and the restriction of the initial homomorphism uh, uh, to zero and minus zero is still a homomorphism on the image, which is zero one minus F of zero. And this is absolute because uh, zero one minus zero. So this is a topological space with one connected component, right? And uh, zero one, you can remove any point, you obtain two connected components, right? All right. So let's get into today's uh, lesson. <clears throat> Today we will define homology. Uh, what I explained last time, I gave you a lot of invariance, right, of topological spaces. That's how we understand topological spaces. Talked about uh, immersibility, uh, number of connected components. I talked about uh, Euler characteristic and Betty numbers, which were the, the most powerful uh, uh, invariance, invariance I presented. Uh, the Betty numbers, right, uh, that indicates a lot of topological properties of our spaces. 
Uh, and I explained that in order to define them, you actually have to define homology, right? The construction of the Betty numbers is based on homology. So this is what we will do today. Uh, just let me give you a, a, some kind of context uh, about uh, homology theory in uh, algebraic topology. So this is what we do, algebraic topology. Uh, there exists a multitude of invariants uh, that can be used. What I'm going to present today is only homology theory, right? The homology groups. Uh, actually, homology is a wide theory, and there are several uh, instances, several incarnations of homology. Uh, what I'm going to present in particular is uh, uh, simply short homology, right? And again, in simply short homology, you can uh, work over a field or over the Z. Uh, what I will do today is uh, singular homology over the finite field z over 2z, which I think is a nice way to enter into this wide uh, subject. Uh, so this is the plan of today. Um, I will start on the first part with a little reminder of algebra, and then we'll get into the definition of, uh, of homology. The main uh, uh, protagonist of today is the, the 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 group Z over two Z. So Z over two Z is the simplest group you can think of. It's the group with one of the simplest with two elements, right? Zero and one, and its uh, addition is like this. Okay, one plus one is zero. Uh, we will need also the product group. So if you take a, an integer n, you can uh, multiply Z over two Z n times by itself. And so you get another group, z over 2z to the n. This is the set of n tuples, right, of elements of z over 2z, 0 and 1. And as for any product group, uh, the, the addition of the group is defined coordinate-wise. OK. z over 2z admits a uh, stronger structure than a group, it can also be given a field structure. It can be given a multiplication, right? And the multiplication is like that. Uh, OK, this is the only choice, actually, you have. But what is it interesting? Because if you have field, you can consider vector spaces. So usually, what we learn uh, are the theory of vector spaces over uh, R or C. The real or complex numbers, but you can have the exact same theory of uh, vector spaces over a field, right? And so the field uh, we will use today is z over 2z. In particular, this product group here is uh, a vector space over z over 2z. Uh, what is a vector space? I just wrote the, the definition that everybody knows, right? A vector space, this is a set, a, a group, right? Uh, uh, you have an addition. And also, an outer uh, scalar multiplication, right? And this is how all the, the uh, axioms of a, of a vector space. Uh, for a group to be uh, a z over 2z vector space, it's actually very easy. You just have to verify that uh, for any element, if uh, the element plus itself is zero, if this, if this holds, then you can give the group a vector space structure over z over 2z. OK. And another fact uh, we will need, uh, if uh, a z over 2z vector space uh, is finite, then it admits a dimension, right? It admits a basis. You can define its dimension. If its dimension is, is n, then uh, you know the, the usual uh, um, characterization of vector spaces of dimension n v uh, is isomorphic to, to z over 2z exponent n, right? The, the field uh, exponent n. And actually, the proof is exactly what uh, you already know about our vector spaces. OK. So if you don't have any question, um, ah, a last fact about vector spaces, I will use the uh, concept of quotient vector space, right? It's the same thing as a quotient of group, if you already know. Um, so I take a, a vector space V and a, a sub vector space, a vector subspace uh, W, right? 
uh, uh, vector subspace is a subset, right? That is stable by the addition and by the scalar multiplication. Now, I can define an equivalence relation on V as follows. I say that, that two vectors UV are uh, equivalent if um, their difference belongs to W, my, in my, my subspace, my vector subspace. You can prove that this is an equivalence relation, and then you can take the quotient uh, set. The quotient set uh, is the, the, the set of equivalence classes with respect to this uh, relation. And actually, it's quite easy to describe the equivalence classes given the vector v, the equivalent class of v um, is just the set v plus w. Okay. The quotient vector space can be endowed with a group structure like this. And, and this is it. Um, a property that is not complicated to prove is that the dimension of the quotient vector space is the, dif the difference of the, of the dimensions. Okay. So this is it for the, for the reminders. Let's get into uh, homology. So what happens is that, uh, um, yeah, no, I will have to define a few notions. So uh, uh, follow me. It's going to last uh, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, in order to define homology, we'll have uh, to define chains, boundaries, cycle, and then uh, homology groups. The theory of homology uh, here is the simplicial homology. That is the, the theory of homology for simplicial complexes, right? Uh, simplicial complexes, I uh, introduced this uh, last lesson. These are uh, combinatorial objects that we use to represent topological spaces, right? I, I wrote the definition again here. Uh, a simplicial complex, you have a first a set of vertices, they are called V here. A simplicial complex of V is a set of subsets. Of v. This subset being called simplices. And you have only one axiom. The subset of a simplex must be a simplex. Okay. So here uh, in a, is an example of a simple complex with uh, four vertices, five edges, and one triangle, right? I will use the following notation in what follows uh, given an integer n, k parenthesis n will be the set of simplices of dimension n, okay? K0 is V, the set of vertices. Uh, K1 is the set of edges. K2, the set of triangle, etc. All right. And now I will do something uh, that I think very funny. I will define an algebraic structure on the simplices. Given n, I define the n chains, and I denote cn of k, the set of formal sums, the set of sums of simplices of dimension n. Um, so sums, linear combinations, if you wish, with coefficients in uh, z over 2z, right? Uh, so I allow myself to sum simplices, okay? This is something we can do. The structure behind is called the, the, the free group generated by the, the simplices. So this is at this point ab abstract. Okay. Uh, if I own myself to some simplices to consider the, the sums, I can define actually a, a group structure on uh, the chains. If I have two uh, chains, two sums of simplices, I say that their, their sum is just the the, 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 the sum of the coefficients coordinate wise. Okay. And this can be given a, a z over 2z uh, vector space structure. So my set of chains is a, a vector space. Uh, so what, what does that mean? I, I put an example here in this simple simplicial complex with two edges and three um, vertices. Uh, for instance, zero here, the, the, the chain that only contain the zero vertex, this is a chain. I can sum them. We have zero plus one, zero plus one plus two. I have also the zero chain that is the, the empty chain, if you wish. 
the when chains are sums of edges, so uh, they are all here. Okay. Um, I can sum these chains, for instance, the sum of zero plus one and zero plus two is equal to one, two, right? Because in this sum, zero appears twice. And uh, in, in z over to z, one plus one is equal to zero. So I cancel my, uh, my vertex. All right. My uh, notion that is called the boundary operator. Uh, if I take a, a simplex, the simplex ha has faces, right? The faces are the uh, subset of the simplex of dimension n minus one. Um, and so I can make this operation linear. I can define the boundary operator that goes from the space of the n dimensional chains to the a minus one dimensional chains. Uh, define as follows the boundary of a simplex is the sum of its faces, right? Seen as a formal sum. Um, and if I have a sum of uh, simplices, I say that the boundary is the sum of the boundaries. Um, so example, here I have my the, this uh, simplicial complex that I showed before. What is the boundary of the edge zero one? It's zero plus one. Okay, the two end vertices. Now you can have funny things that happen. What is the boundary of this chain? Zero one plus one two plus two zero. I compute, right? The boundary of the sum is the sum of the boundaries by definition. And look, I have the vertex one twice, the vertex zero twice, and the vertex two twice. So everything cancels, and in the end, I have zero. So this chain is boundaryless. This chain has no boundary, right? Another example, uh, what is the boundary of the triangle zero, one, two? Well, it's the sum of its faces, zero, one, one, two, two, zero. You can see something funny here. Uh, if I take again the boundary, it will be zero, right? We've seen before that the boundary of the these three edges, the sum of these three edges is zero. And this is actually a general fact. For any uh, chain that you take, if you apply twice the boundary operator, then you get zero, okay? The, the double boundary of any chain is zero. And uh, did I put the proof? Yeah, the, the proof is, is very simple. You, you just write what is the boundary of the boundary and you have a double sum that you write differently. And you see that you have a factor two between each simplex and two is zero, okay? So what do we got? Uh, a sequence of vector spaces, right? The, the, the different spaces of chains. And these spaces are connected with the boundary operators, right? Now, I will define uh, two important objects. Given n, okay, I, I go in a particular space of chains. I define the n cycles as the kernel of this boundary operator, okay? The kernel, the set of chains that goes to zero. Uh, and I will also define the boundaries as the image of the boundary operator before that goes into the space, okay? So it's written here. Uh, for instance, in this simplicial complex, what are the one cycles? The one cycles, okay? These are the elements of the kernel of the boundary operator. So these are the chains that have zero boundary. So we have this one, as we've seen already, but also this one and also this one. Okay, you can compute uh, that they uh, are cycles. And the one boundary is, so these are the images of uh, two dimensional uh, chains. Actually, we have only two two dimensional chain, the empty chain, and this triangle here. The image, the boundary of the uh, zero chain is zero, and the boundary of the triangle, as we've seen before, is this um, 
uh, chain of three edges. Okay. And so, as a consequence of the fact that the boundary of the boundary is zero, I have that the boundaries are cycles. The set, the, 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 the space of boundaries is a subset of the space of the cycles, right? What I mean is that these two elements here belong to this set on the left, right? And now the main interpretation to understand uh, simple homology is the following. With the cycles, what we look for are holes in our space, right? These two chains here define this triangular hole. But among these, these chains, you have chains that are not holes. You know, this one here, the second one, is filled. You know, but what is that? This is a boundary. So in the end, these boundaries are the cycles that are not actual holes. Right? So what I would like to do is to take the cycles and to kill, to remove to cancel the uh, boundaries, right? And this is exactly the, the definition of homology group. I take a N, I have uh, these subsets of the chains, boundaries and cycles. My simple homology group, uh, the nth simple homology group is the co vector space of the cycles by the boundaries, okay? So I took the, the holes, I killed the boundaries, and I only left with actual holes. And in this structure, if you look at the equivalence classes, you will see that this chain here is equivalent, is equal to this chain here, right? Uh, so my homology group is a quotient vector space. So it is a vector space. Say it has dimension. Uh, say it is finite, in our case, it will always be finite. So it has a dimension, right? Let's say its dimension is K, then the vector space is isomorphic to Z over to Z exponent K. And I will give a name to this K. I will call it the nth beta number, all right? If I have a simple complex K, I compute its homology group. It will be Z over to Z to the K. And this k will be denoted beta m, the k uh, Betty number. So as an example, if you compute the homology groups of this simple complex, you will get h0 is z over to z, h1 z over to z, and h2 0. So the Betty numbers by definition will be 1, the dimension of z over to z, 1, and 0. OK? So now. We can have a new look at this table I gave uh, two days ago, right? Uh, my five topological spaces, the Betty numbers, and now we know that behind these Betty numbers is hidden a vector space, the homology group, and the Betty number is nothing but the dimension of the homology group. All right. Any question about that? Okay. No, thank you. Very clear. Um, let me see. Um, I, I think I won't enter into the details uh, regarding the algorithm to compute homology groups. Um, but what may also TDA uh, uh, work is that you actually have a very uh, um, efficient algorithm to compute these uh, homology group and persistent homology groups that we will see later. Um, basically, if you have a simplicial complex, you can compute its homology groups uh, uh, incrementally. So what you do is you take your simple complex and you will add simplices one by one and you will compute the, 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 the changes in, in, the, in the, the homology groups. Um, so you, will, you can prove that when you add a simplex, you only have simple modification of the homology groups, and then you, you will derive an algorithm. Um, maybe I will talk about that next time. 
just a funny, a funny fact. In the end, the actual implementation of the algorithm to compute homology groups is not thing but a Gauss reduction of a matrix. You will define uh, what is called the boundary matrix. The boundary matrix is the matrix where you put all the simplices and then you put the boundary of the simplices. For instance, sigma 5 here is this edge. Its boundary is sigma 1 and sigma 2, the vertices. So I put a one here and a one here. I have a big matrix like that, that indicates the boundary of all simplices. And I can just do a, a ghost reduction in the end. I can read the homology groups on the reduced uh, matrix. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> so linear algebra. It's just down to linear algebra. Absolutely, yeah, it's only linear algebra. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's also linear algebra because I presented the theory over uh, uh, no, the no. field. I say right? computationally, computationally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. This is why we like it also. Um, all right, so there is a lot of things to say about homology. I'd like to point out three uh, details that I think are important to understand what we will do later in uh, persistent homology. Uh, first, I will uh, go back to this problem of triangulations that we evoked uh, last time. Uh, because what we want is a theory for topological spaces, right? But what I presented uh, is the uh, homology for simple short complexes, right? So how can we go from the realm of simple short complexes to the realm of topological spaces um, you have uh, to give the simple short complexes a topology. Okay, so how can we do that? I define here the standard simplices. So given an integer n, the standard simplex, this is a subset of R n plus 1 that is defined like that. Delta n, it is the set of n plus 1 tuples of non-negative coordinates that sum to one, okay? So delta zero, this is a subset of R1, and it's actually just a point. Delta one is this line here, and delta two is this triangle, etc. Delta three will be a tetrahedron. The tetrahedron. Uh, problem is that it will be in R4, and so it's hard to, to visualize, right? Uh, by the way, in the end, uh, um, what I wrote here is simply the convex hull uh, of the of the canonical basis, right? The convex hull of a set of points, it is the set of uh, convex combinations, right, of these points. So you can also understand the standard simplex of dimension n as the convex hull of the n plus one canonical basis vectors of our n plus one. All right, so now I uh, have seen simplices as subsets of the Euclidean space. I want to see simple short complexes as subsets of the Euclidean space, right? Because what I say is that um, if you can see a topological space, an object as a subset of the Euclidean space, then it has a natural topology, right? How can we uh, represent a simple short complex in the Euclidean uh, space? We will glue all the pieces. And there is a very nice construction to do that. Let K be a simple short complex. So at this point, it is abstract. Uh, it is only a combinatorial object. Uh, and let's say it has N vertices. I will embed my simple short complex in Rm. OK? And what I do is that uh, I will take all the basis, the canonical basis vectors, EI, and then I will define uh, the topological uh, realization of K, K between two bars, as the union of the standard simplices of these points, right? I look at the simplices of my simple complex, and I draw them. I take their convex hull in Rn. 
So this way, I can embed my symmetry complex in the Euclidean space. So it is a subset and I can uh, define its topology. Um, so it's actually, it's a nice construction, but not very useful in practice, right? Because you need as many dimensions as vertices the simple complex has. So if you have uh, 1 million uh, vertices, it will not be a very useful construction. No, theoretically, it's very nice. And this way, I uh, can make my simple complexes topological spaces. Sometimes you don't need that many dimensions to uh, embed your simple complex. For instance, this guy here has four vertices, but I can uh, uh, draw it in the plane, right? If I can draw it like that in a smaller dimensional space without crossings, you don't have, you're not, uh, you cannot cross the edges and simplices. Then the induced topology, the subspace topology, will be the same as the one uh, defined before. Okay. And so now the main uh, question is, is, is the following. Uh, given a topological space, I say that a translation of the topological space X uh, is a simple complex whose topologicalization is homomorphic to X. Well, I can't say uh, statements, I can uh, write statements like that because simple short complexes now have a topological structure. Uh, so for instance, we've seen the last time that uh, the, the, the circle, right, is represented by this triangle, it is a simple short complex. And I can say that the topologicalization of this simple short complex is homomorphic to the circle. Uh, this uh, um, simple complex is a sphere, is homomorphic. If you see it as a subspace of R3, for instance, it's homomorphic to a sphere. So I was able to triangulate the circle and uh, the sphere. Is that possible in general? If I give you a topological space, can you triangulate it? Unfortunately, you can't. There are a lot of uh, topological spaces that are not triangulable. Uh, it has been proven actually uh, recently that uh, in any dimension for a, a very nice class of topological spaces that are uh, compact, compact topological manifolds, uh, you have some of them that does not admit a triangulation, okay? So when you do simple topology, when you do uh, TDA, Preston homology, we restrict ourselves to the spaces that admit the triangulation. That already contain a, a lot of very interesting spaces, don't worry. And the second remark is that if your space admits a triangulation, then it actually, it actually admits a lot of triangulations. There is no unicity of triangulation. For instance, any uh, polygon will be a triangulation of the circle. Okay. Sorry, uh, Rafael, my first question. Please. Yeah, regarding the theorem, I mean, why, I don't know if like that's, I don't know, a big um, off tour maybe, but uh, what, what type of um, characterization do we need then to determine whether a space is triangularizable or not? I mean, you know, apparently if this, whatever it is, I mean, it only happens for dimension greater than to five. But, I mean, what, what, what is it? I mean, can, can you say in a few words or not? Yeah, so first, so okay. You cannot hope to triangulate topological spaces in general because this is very wild. You know, uh, you, you, your space must be first, uh, let's say compact because we work with finite dimensional uh, simple complexes. Um, sure. You needed a, a few, um to be host off you know mm -hmm. separable topological properties but once you uh, in, in, uh, impose these topological properties uh, uh, even nice looking spaces are not triangulable so for manifolds for instance it is uh, who proved that that um smooth manifolds are triangulable well, which one is soft manifolds yeah. It's so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if you only have, 
And so what, what is that dimension greater than five? Uh, in the, the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional manifolds, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are smoothable, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, the, the, the question is easy for low-dimensional manifolds. Mm -hmm. For dimension four, uh, is more complicated. I think, I don't know if this is true, that any topological manifold in dimension four admits a smooth structure. structure. Um, but they are triangulable. And then dimension greater than five, a lot of wild things happen, you know, like uh, these, these spheres with a lot of different uh, smooth structures or these spaces that do not admit a, a smooth structure, uh, these kind mm -hmm. of things. But let's say it's a general fact of, of topology of manifolds, uh, this, uh, this result. All right, okay, that's fine, well, thanks. All right. <laughs> So this is it for triangulations. Uh, let me talk a little bit about homology. Uh, I presented homology for simplicial complexes. Uh, we would like a theory for topological spaces. What you could do is say, you have a topological space, you take its triangulation, and you take uh, its uh, uh, simplicial homology groups. But this is a bit weird. What a better way to do is to directly uh, write down a theory of homology for uh, topological spaces. And this is called singular homology. And it goes like that. I uh, will do a quick uh, overview of it. Uh, in in, in, in a singular homology, you have a topological space X. And you define simplices now as uh, uh, embeddings, uh, images, let's say, of the usual standard simplex. Uh, for instance, in this Mobius band, uh, I, I drawn uh, three uh, singular simplices. This point here, it's a zero dimensional simplex. This curved line, it's one dimensional. And this kind of disk triangle, this is a two dimensional simplex. Okay. And just as we did before, we can define the notion of boundary of this singular simplices. I take the boundary of the standard simplex. So it's a, a, a sum of uh, faces. And I can look at the image of this sum of faces. OK? So what I've done here is the definition of simplicial homology, as we have seen uh, um, before. You take sum of simplices, you do boundaries, change, blah, 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 and you end up with homology groups. Singular homology is exactly the same, but instead of sum of uh, simplices, you take sums of singular simplices. Okay, uh, and you end up with also homology groups that are called singular homology groups. So uh, don't worry; these uh, singular homology groups are actually equal to the simplicial homology groups, okay? If I have a topological space X and a triangulation K, then uh, uh, the homology groups agree, singular and simplicial, okay? This is what I, I, I wrote here. Circle, topological space, and polygon, uh, simplicial complex. What is, what is nice with uh, singular homology? You can prove very easily uh, uh, Evarin's theorem. If you have two uh, homotopy equivalent topological spaces, X and Y, then the homology groups of these spaces are equal. Okay? So uh, homology, singular homology, is an invariant of homotopy classes of topological spaces. And as a corollary, uh, if you mix together this result and this result, you get the same statement for simplicial homology. If you have two simplicial complexes that are homotopy equivalent uh, as topological spaces, then they have the same simplicial homology groups, right? So now you will wonder 
Yeah, well, why, why should I go, uh, in, in, why should I use singular homology to prove this results? Cannot I prove this directly um, in the world of uh, simplicial homology? Uh, the answer is no, basically. Uh, actually, singular homology has been developed last century to exactly answer this question at the beginning. It's, I mean, uh, in, in this, the world of uh, combinatorial object like simplicial complex, complexes, uh, this question of homotopy equivalence is, is, is complicated and it's simpler to just pass uh, to go through topological spaces. Okay, but well, the, the take home message here is that homology groups are invariants of homotopy classes. Okay. A last uh, comment about homology is a property named functoriality. So, homology, uh, let's say here a singular homology, if some it is an operator that takes a topological space, X, right, and gives you a vector space, the ith homology group here. But it does better, actually. What you can do is transform also continuous mass. If you have a pair of topological spaces x, y, and a map f between these spaces, you can transform those spaces to get homology groups, and you can also transform the map to get the map between vector spaces, uh, a linear map. Okay? I didn't, I won't explain how you can define this, but it's not very complicated. You will have to go back to the definition of the homology with chains and cycles, all of that, but it's not complicated. This operation satisfies a very important property, is that it preserves commutative diagrams. So what is that? If you have a triplet of vector spaces, X, Y, Z, and two continuous map, F and G, as here, uh, you also have the composition, GF, right? Let's say I transform everything in homology. So I have three homology groups and three maps. And the property that is satisfied is the following. The transformation of the composition is equal to the composition of the transformations. So homology uh, uh, of maps respects the initial structures of the commutative diagrams. Um, this is the very important property that makes uh, homology a functor in the context of category theory. Homology is a functor between the category of topological spaces or simplicial complexes to the category of uh, vector spaces. Uh, it's a very powerful property, and with this property, you can prove very easily uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, right? Uh, which is a, a strong result that says that if you have a continuous map uh, from the ball of Rn to itself, then this uh, map has a fixed uh, point. I don't think I have, yeah, I won't, I won't uh, explain the proof, but if you want to have a look, you can just uh, uh, go into my website. I put the slides of today. It's a very nice uh, proof. But, um, what I would like to do now is uh, enter into the world of uh, applied uh, topology. <laughs> and I will now present what can be considered as the initial uh, problem of uh, TDA, the problem of homological uh, inference. So the problem can be formulated as follows. Let's say you have a pan cloud X. X is your observation, is uh, what you got from a, a scientific experiment, a machine learning problem, like a, a database. This pan cloud X is discrete, but you think of it as a sample of uh, underlying continuous, uh, let's say manifold uh, uh, object, okay? Here, we could say that this punk cloud is uh, close to a circle, okay? 
And now the question is, given the observation X, can I recover the homology groups of M, my underlying circle? Okay. If I can do that, then I have uh, a nice idea of what is the underlying topological space. And this is what we want to do in TDD. So how could we do that? A very uh, simple idea would be to, well, I take my X and I compute its homology, right? But this is not very interesting because what is the homology of X? X is a discrete set. So its uh, uh, first built-in number beta zero is equal to its number of uh, points. And the other built-in numbers are, are zero. There is no topology in the discrete set, set like that, right? So you have to think about something better. Uh, and uh, the idea in TDA is actually a very simple idea, is to take the set X and to thicken it. Uh, what does I mean by, uh, what do I mean by thicken? Um, <clears throat> let's take a parameter T, right? The T thickening of my set X that I write X T, X exponent T, is the set of points of the ambient space at distance at most t from x, all right? I enlarge, I thicken my set. So for instance, the 0, 0, 5 thickening of x will be like that. The 0, 1 thickening, the 0, 2 thickening, right? The points uh, distance at most, at most 0, 2 from x. And what happens if I continue this construction, 0, 3, 0, 4, Something interesting happened. Look, at this value, the thickening is a, a, a circle. Topologically speaking, it's a kind of an analysis, homotopic equivalent to a circle, right? If I go too far, then I destroy the topology, right? Here, it's only a big set of uh, intersecting disks, and this has the, the homotopy type of the points. But what I've seen is that, at some point during this construction, I obtained circles, right? So if I'm able to select a, a nice parameter, I can compute the homology groups, I can compute the Betty numbers of the thickening, and this will give me the Betty numbers of the underlying manifold, right? Uh, so this is exactly what we will do. There are two questions. First question. How can I find this T, this parameter, uh, this nice parameter? And second question, once I have this T, how can I compute the uh, homology groups? Like what algorithm can I use? So I will uh, answer this, these two questions. Um, I think I need 15 minutes, uh, something, something like that. To answer the first question, I will need two notions, the host of distance and the reach. Let's start with the host of distance. Um, first, I will define uh, the distance function to uh, a set. Here, X is a subset of Rn. The distance function to X is a map from Rn to R, okay? Uh, that takes uh, a point of Rn and gives the, the, the smallest distance between Y and the point of X. Okay, you look at the closest point. Actually, we, we will give a name to this closest point. We will call it a projection. Okay. Then I define the host of distance between. Uh, Two subset x and y, the host of distance is the maximal distance between a point of the first set and its projection uh, on the other set. Okay, uh, this defines uh, a distance on the uh, subsets of Rn. Actually, if you want this to be an actual distance, 
not only a pseudo distance, you have to consider only compact subspaces, but um, we will use it for any subset. I put here an alternative definition of the Osdorf distance. Uh, the Osdorf distance is also the smallest value of t, such that x is included in the t thickening of y and y in the t thickening of x. Okay. For instance, here x is a point cloud and y is a circle. You see that the circle is included in the zero tree thickening of the point cloud, and conversely also. So the hose of distance between x and y is lower than uh, zero tree. Second notion that I need is the uh, medial axis. So given uh, the subset X, the medial axis is the set of ambient points, of points of the ambient space that admits two projections. Uh, what I mean by that is that if you take this point and look at the projections, the closest point of the set, you have two different, uh, you can find two different uh, projections. Uh, so this is the medial axis. So for instance, what is the middle axis of the circle? It's the set of points that admit, uh, it, uh, I mean, sorry, it's, it's the center. The center of the circle, if you look at all the points of the circle, have the same distance to the center. What is the middle axis of an ellipse? It is the segment, right? All the points of this segment admit two projections on the ellipse. The middle axis of a point along is the empty set. The middle axis of two points is the bisector. And this in very nice because the bisector, as we learn in school, is defined as the set of points that are at equal distance from the two points, right? So this is exactly this definition. Now I define the reach. The reach is the distance from the medial axis to the set. Okay, so the reach of the circle is its radius. The reach of the ellipse is this finger here that depends on the curvature of the ellipse. Reach of the point is infinite, and reach of two points is the mid length, the mid distance. Okay, and now look at this nice result. If I take a parameter t, the reach, then the t thickening of the set is homotopy equivalent to the set itself. You can uh, look at this drawing. Here, I've thickened the circle for a value lower than the radius. This is nonetheless, this is a circle topologically. Same for the ellipse, same for the points, and same for the two points. Now, if you go higher, if you take a higher value than the reach, then it could be uh, not homotopy equivalent anymore, right? If I go beyond the radius here, the thickening of the circle is just a disk, right? Homotopy equivalent to a point. So we have to, yeah. And the proof of this is actually very simple. Um, and so now the solution to our first question, how can I select a T such that my thickening has the homotopy type of my underlying manifold? Well, I can follow this uh, theorem uh, that says that uh, I have to select a T in this interval, not too, not too small, not too big, uh, depending on the husband. Yeah. Sorry? Hello, Nancy. Hi. I think, I think uh, she would just want to say hi. hi sorry, my late. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, all right, so uh, you have to select the value of t depending on the host of distance between x and m and uh, the reach of m. Okay, you have another version of this uh, theorem or so, um, where it's a bit more restrictive because here you uh, ask that M is a submanifold, where before you just need any set with positive reach. But well, that's the solution to our first question. 
What do I do now? I have uh, my parameter t, my thickening. I want to compute the homology of, of this uh, uh, thickening. But at this point, it's only a topological space. I want to convert it into a simplicial complex so as to use the algorithms. Um, I have to find a triangulation. Okay. Definition of triangulation I said that it is a simplicial complex homomorphic to my space. Actually, in this context, we need uh, something even weaker. I just need a simplicial complex that is homotopy equivalent, right? Because homology groups are invariants of homotopy classes. You could call that a weak triangulation if you, if you wish, right? For instance, the circle. This is a triangulation of the circle, and this will be a weak triangulation. But the, the homology groups of all these spaces are equal. So, how can I do that? You can use a, a construction that I love, and that is called the nerve. Uh, the nerve of a topological space uh, is defined actually from a cover. A cover of a space is a set of subsets that, that we call uh, members of the cover, uh, such that the union of the subsets, the union of the members, cover the space is equal to x. Okay. Once you have a cover like that, you can define the nerve. The nerve is a simplicial complex, abstractly defined as follows. The um, vertices of this simplicial complex will be the members of the cover, and the simplices will be the sets of members that intersect. Let me give you an example here. I have a circle and a cover by four uh, subsets. So I put four vertices, one for each member of the, of the cover. And then I add simplices. So U1 and U2, they intersect. So I put an edge between one and two. U2 and U3 intersect, I put an edge. Same for three, four, and four, one. And this is my nerve, okay? Here, a square. Let's take another example. If I take a thickening of a point cloud, it has a natural cover, the cover given by the balls, by the disks. And I can compute the nerve. I have as many vertices as uh, disks, so as initial points, actually. And then I put simplices. In this case, I have edges, but I have also higher dimensional simplices. For instance, here I have a triangle. This is because I have a threefold intersection. You have three disks that intersect. Can, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, the first uh, equation say equ uh, equality. Here, x is the um, will be the, the circle underline or the set of points? Uh, the x of the definition? Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, it will be the union of the disks. At the union of the disk, OK. Yeah, yeah. Okay. x is the union of the disk, and the cover is the set of the disks. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also have here uh, three dimensional simplices, right? Because I have four fold intersections. If I increase the radius of this thickening, what I end up is with uh, higher dimensional simplices, right? Because more balls will, be, will intersect like that. Here I have a six simplex. Okay. And you can see something interesting here. Uh, the nerve on the left, on the right, and the topological space on the left, they have the same homotopy type, right? And this is actually a theorem, the nerve theorem. If you cover your space with a nice, with a nice cover, uh, a nice cover is when you are made of balls, or more generally, closed convex uh, sets, then the nerve is homotopy equivalent to your space, right? And so far as that's great, because it means that um, if you want to compute the uh, homology groups of the thickening, you just compute the nerve and you compute its homology groups. The nerve of the thickening has a name, and the name is the check uh, complex. So we solved the second question how to compute the homology 
uh, groups. Should I stop now, Stefanella? I only need to talk um, five minutes about the RIPS complex bug. Yes, yes, we have uh, five minutes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's continue in the as you as you know this is our favorite rips <laughs> so... <laughs> okay yeah so i mean in using a tda software you can compute this check complex but it's complicated why is it complicated because the nerve uh, is defined as uh, you know you have to compute the you have to determine where the bones intersect right uh, and the problem of uh, knowing if, let's say, K balls intersect is a, a well-known problem in computational geometry. Um, that is called uh, uh, that is called the smallest circle problem. So let's say you have a, a, a point cloud in the parameter t, wondering uh, whether uh, um, how many subsets. Uh, of vertices uh, define balls that intersect is highly expensive to compute, right? And so there is a, a modification of this construction that is actually more used in, in practice. And this construction is called the RIPS uh, complex that I will introduce right now. Uh, first, I will um, talk about clicks. So let G be a graph, a click of a graph. What is it? It is a complete subgraph of the graph, right? A complete subgraph is a graph that has all the possible edges. So for instance, this is a two click, this is a three click, and this is a four click, right? Uh, four vertices and all the, all the possible edges between these four vertices. Uh, now, given a graph, I can define a simplicial complex over it that I call the click complex. And it's simply the simplicial complex whose simplices are the clicks, right? I, so what, what do I do? Actually, I, I filled, I filled the, 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 the clicks with these simplices, right? And you can prove that it's, it, it satisfies the, axiom, the axioms of a simplicial uh, complex. Okay, <clears throat> so now, well, how do we use that in practice? You have a point cloud and the parameter t. You will build a graph, gt, uh, uh, whose vertices are the initial points on the x, and whose edges are the pairs of points at distance at most 2t, right? Uh, so what is it actually this graph? This graph is simply the underlying graph of the check complex, right? Because if two points have distance less than 2t, then it means that the balls of radius t intersect. And now I will take the click complex of this graph. And the click complex of this graph, I will call it the ribs complex. Okay? Uh, the ribs complex may not be equal to the check complex. Here, I put an example where, you know, it's missing a triangle in the check complex, or I mean, there is an additional triangle in the ribs complex. Um, so this may be a problem for a homological inference, though the ribs and the check are not that far away uh, from each other. You can prove that the ribs is always between the check of parameter t and the check of parameter 2t, right? So you have a kind of a linear a multiplicative error uh, uh, that will be useful for us uh, when I talk about TDA next time. But uh, um, oh, what, what is interesting with this RIPS complex is that it's way easier to compute because we only have to build the, the, the graph and then take the click complex. This is way faster than uh, the finding the k fold intersections with the smaller circle problem with the check. Um, all right. 
So I will conclude. Today, uh, we talked about uh, homology, simple homology. I talked even about uh, singular homology a little bit of topological spaces. Uh, I introduced the problem of homological inference. Uh, and we've seen that this problem is solved uh, by first selecting an, a, a good value of t according to these theorems, computing the thickening, computing the corresponding nerve, and taking the homology groups. Uh, actually, I lied a little bit uh, today because this parameter t here, how do we choose it? According to these theorems, it depends on the host of distance between your point cloud and your manifold and the reach of your manifold. But in practice, we don't know these, uh, these values. The underlying manifold is not known. What we only have access to is the bond cloud. So unfortunately, this is not very usable in practice, uh, this uh, whole uh, technique. And what we will do to uh, solve this problem is to call uh, a persistent homology. And the idea of persistent homology is that instead of selecting this thing, uh, um, we will uh, 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 use all the, all the possible values of t. Uh, um, I should I should present to you this this this, this example. Uh, this is uh, um, a point cloud that is simple on the torus, right? But if you look at the curve it draws, uh, you can also see it as a one-dimensional space. So is this space one-dimensional or two-dimensional? That's not clear. And in this context, these results cannot apply, right? TDA, again, saves us uh, uh, by selecting all the values of T. And we will see how, from uh, all these values, we can extract interesting topological information. And so this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much again. So, uh, some people had to go because they had classes, but they're, thank you once more for this great lecture. Thank you so much. So please join me to thank uh, Raphael for another great lecture. So, so um, question, question. You're shy. Ah, yes, Raphael, can you recommend uh, beside your note, there are some books that you recommend uh, to see some of these parts? Uh, some hello um yeah depending on um for example this nerve this uh, but connected to data always with this hame the study data you know to see some of this part of the nerving and um uh, i mean it, it doesn't I mean, from a, uh so um I don't have it here. A book I wrote about algebraic. So I mean, this notion of nerve simplicial singular homology is nice to to actually read the algebraic topology book. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the book that I love is a uh, Hatcher. Mm -hmm. um, Beside Hatcher, there is the classical book. Is there others? I will try to find something nice and I, 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 I like tell you next time. I know there is a- It could a, be also uh, lecture notes from some classes. Uh, it doesn't need to- um, um, Sometimes or some. You have a tutorial of TDA and statistics by Frédéric Chazal and uh, Bertrand Michel uh, that I think is nice. Can you send us? Can you send yeah. us? Okay, great. In the specific case, we like RIPS concert because in our case makes sense also because we look at synchro uh, synchronization of time series. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to do, yeah, well, yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, for example, in the case of Nessie, she works on the problem of characterization of surfaces, and somehow we thought that maybe this is uh, because she's studying the problem of propagation of fungus on the surface. And so uh, we thought that this could be related to somehow a problem that 
there are studied uh, let's uh, elizabeth munch study uh with uh, max uh, a student her in the university of michigan in michigan state sorry uh that they study roughness and they use they use a different level set you know they they scan the surface and they try to characterize the level set so we'll mm. So that is a different technique. Uh, mm, interesting. So yes, yes. So this is why Nancy is here. <laughs> and uh, actually, yes, it's interesting to see these different techniques. Uh, they're all connected to. Nancy, you like to comment something about it? I don't know if she's still here. I don't know. I think she's gone. Ah, she's gone. Okay. Uh, so well, maybe next time we'll we'll see if. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Julieta said that she has to process. Don't worry, Julieta. Uh, Raphael has very nice set of notes and lecture <laughs> online. So, okay. Uh, any question from others? Uh, yeah, Virginia as well. Don't worry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so okay, so uh, I'm sure if you think about it in next lecture, Raphael will be happy to answer to some of the questions, even if maybe you think about during the weekend and you send some email, he can think about it. For I love week. it. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, this means to be an interactive, you know, so questions are welcome. And uh, here there are people from different backgrounds and different levels so all questions are very welcome please okay so thank you so much rafael once more thank and you. Uh, see you see you next week yeah. same time on tuesday yeah. uh, we'll <laughs> wait for you everyone so please thank you everyone for the participation bye bye thank you bye bye bye, -bye. Uh, see you bye bye